Well, it's Tuesday, 4 p.m., and it's time for Pandora's Box. Pandora's Box is a bi-monthly audio magazine. A distraction piloted world of communication. We, the masses, we, the greater public, are colluding with technology as we spill the beans. We open our devices and let our information slide into that oceanic pool of artificial intelligence. We're doing Artificial Intelligence 101 with Scott Christensen, assistant teaching professor at the College of Business at the University of Missouri. And Scott, it's so good of you to come up to KOPN. Well, thank you so much for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. And um, I'm always interested in talking about technologies and how they're affecting our society. That's one of the main... um, kind of themes of some of the courses I teach. We find that uh, a lot of technology is really changing our world and changing how we behave, and trying to understand that can be a challenge. Yeah, I think it really can be a challenge, especially for the uninformed and less suspicious public. We digested the terminology of artificial intelligence, logarithms, but we have very little idea of what it really means. Mm -hmm. Well, let's just start with some definitions then. So artificial intelligence is a very broad term that represents a um, concept of a machine or computer being able to think in some way. Uh, Now there's what we call general AI, which is this idea that you might have a computer that was so autonomous that it would be able to think like a human. Uh, So a very famous computer scientist, Alan Turing, came up with this idea of the Turing test, and he believed that eventually computers would be able to think, maybe not like humans, but be able to think on their own as computers. Now, there's been several objections to this uh, over the years uh, as to whether that's true or not, but that's often what we think about when we think about artificial intelligence. But you're very right that um, some parts of this are starting to creep into our lives. So uh, there's a subset of artificial intelligence called machine learning, and machine learning is basically a way that we can ask a computer to optimize uh, a process or optimize um, some criteria and then let it learn how to do that on its own. So it's a very powerful technique uh, where we don't have to program every single aspect of what that computer has to encounter. Uh, So for example, image recognition is a big one. So if I We're was, talking, they're talking a lot about that in China right now. Right. Yeah. So if I want to identify the difference between a human and let's say a raccoon, okay. So uh, what I could do is set out as a programmer, and I would type in all the various if statements. You know, if the if the thing is this big, if the thing has fur, all that kind of stuff, and that would take forever just to uh, understand the difference between a human and a raccoon. Now, if you were to use machine learning, what you would do is you would uh, set up the machine and then you'd give it thousands of pictures of a raccoon and you give it thousands of pictures of a human and it could figure out the difference then. And so in that way, um, the machine learns on its own, develops its own criteria to figure out what are the differences and how can it discern this. So then it becomes very good. That's called the training data. So you would train the AI. And then from then on, it can be very accurate in interpreting other images. So if some of your listeners are probably on Facebook. If you go to Facebook and you upload a picture now, and I upload a picture of you and me here in the studio, uh, it would uh, maybe identify you as Daria, right? And it would identify me as Scott. It would say, hey, do you want to tag these? Well, that's because Facebook's AI has learned from all the photos we uploaded previously of what we look like. Okay, so uh, you were talking about China and the facial recognition. Uh, So you can not only identify humans, but you can identify individual humans. And so certainly we could imagine some good uh, aspects of this, but unfortunately um, these optimization algorithms don't really care whether they're being used in an ethical manner or an unethical manner. 
So one of the things that I think uh, is a little misconception about AI is that people imagine this Skynet or the Terminator or some other big uh, threat out there, but it's really the way that humans are using AI, um, you know, with other humans uh, in these systems. And um, there's all sorts of ways that AI is being used. For example, a lot of businesses here in town, are their employees are scheduled via an AI. So you get these weird hours that people are working, like they may have to close on one night and open the next morning. Well, that's because the AI has decided to optimize their hours without regard for the fact that humans may need to sleep a little. You're talking about ethical. And when we say ethical and non-ethical, that's up for interpretation. And, and certainly corporations will be thinking in terms of ethics in a much different way than individual people. Right. And so uh, ethics vary uh, not only by individual, but also by culture. There's a very interesting project uh, that MIT did called The Moral Machine. And they, uh, if you remember from... Uh, undergraduate or high school, this whole trolley problem, right? So the, and you take psychology, I think it's psychology uh, courses where I first saw that, and uh, you have this trolley problem where uh, there's a trolley going along and it's going to hit um, uh, you know, five young children, um, but you could divert it and kill this uh, old guy that's on the uh, sidetrack. And do you take action to... Uh, uh, Spare the lives of right. five so, for... Um, so it kind of splits between natural rights and utilitarianism. So there's kind of two big frameworks for morality. Um, and so uh, MIT took this problem and then modernized it with autonomous cars. So we have an autonomous car now driving. Uh, it is in a situation where it no longer can prevent an accident from happening. Does it kill the one driver that's in it and save the uh, pedestrian? Or does it hit the pedestrian and save the driver? And uh, so they had a huge number of people go on their website and run through these different scenarios. And they found that there were some significant differences between uh, cultures even. So here in the West, we tend to revere the young over the old. So in Japan, that's not quite the same. So they might put on equal footing a young person and an old person, or maybe even value the old person more than the young person in such a scenario, whereas in the West, we're, we're not. So um, you get into some really uh, weird um, situations there uh, where you're having to look at to uh, what to optimize. So what, what should we optimize when we're dealing with autonomous cars if they ever come to fruition? And by optimizing the individual human is putting in information, right. the weight of justice or something more. Yeah. But will the machine at some time suck in the information? And Yeah, and I think that's a long way off. That's once again kind of getting into that whole idea of general AI. Mm -hmm. But you're talking about uh, corporations and, and how this is being used. Well, let's look at one that's in the news today, and that's Facebook. Okay, So a lot of people are talking about Facebook, obviously, with the Cambridge Analytica scandal. There's actually right now a great documentary on uh, Netflix called The Great Hack, which talks about that. And uh, But one thing that Facebook um, does is it is using machine learning algorithms to shoot for or optimize certain things. So, for example, maybe Facebook decides that uh, it would like to optimize for us clicking on ads or spending more time on the site. Now, it's doing that, and it will figure out what is the best content to give to you in order to get you to do that, in order to modify your behavior. Mm -hmm. So we're now talking about algorithms optimizing our behavior. Uh, but it's not going to tell... Uh, there's other consequences. So maybe by feeding me some real right-wing or left-wing material that may or may not be true, they can get me more excited, they can get me to stay on the site longer, right? And the moderate stuff is kind of boring. It's like where most people are, right? Uh, but uh, we don't get as uh, excited or uh, upset about it. So these machine learning algorithms are having some really bad consequences on our political discourse, uh, on our 
view of our self-worth. So if you look at um, like Instagram, uh, you know, you don't post the, boy, I'm having a crappy day on Instagram, right? You, you post your vacation pictures and how great you are and how wonderful your life is. Well, you view all your friends there and, and uh, you may feel that your life isn't as great as theirs. So we see more increased suicide rates in younger adults and more self-harm, especially with younger women. Um, and so that may be the side effect of these machine learning uh, algorithms that are optimizing for keeping people on the site, keeping people clicking on ads. They're not doing it in a way that is ethical, or at least I would view as ethical. It's, it's been stated so many times that our data, our personal data, is the petrol oil of the future, but it really isn't the future. It's the the main economic boom of today. Right. Is that true? Um, yeah. It's you know there's been phrases about how uh, if you're not paying for something you're the product. Um, I don't know that that's uh, entirely true, but basically our data becomes a uh, predictor of our behavior, right? Mm. And so some people are calling this surveillance capitalism. You look at Facebook and Twitter. Well. Those are free platforms for us to use. We freely give information. Well, that becomes the raw data for these predictive models. And so now they can predict with a high level of accuracy, if we show Scott this ad for whatever a 50-year-old professor, nerdy professor would like. I don't yeah. know what, what kind of advertising that would be. A good cup of coffee. A good cup of coffee, exactly. A nice new coffee cup that has some sort of Bluetooth connection or something. Um, that would uh, be up here for me. And uh, for advertisers, it's been great because obviously they want to manipulate our behavior into buying something. That's the whole purpose of marketing and advertising. Yeah. And unfortunately, humans are much more, um, we would like to think of ourselves as very, being very uh, autonomous. autonomous, under self-control, we're self very agency. rational. <laughs> yeah, and, and it's probably not uh, as much as we would like, right? Yeah, and you talk about surveillance capitalism. I mean, there's, there was a great program on alternative radio just recently. It's, it's very frightening. What is this larger area of nefarious <laughs> outcomes that governments are thinking of. Right. They, so you look at like Duarte and other uh, places where you have these dictators that, you know, are basically uh, being able to use these platforms to manipulate the public uh, uh, sentiment. And you look at Myanmar where you basically have a genocide that originated on Facebook. Uh, you know, it's just really um, disturbing how much influence these things can have. Yeah, that's a big question. You know, it's use in government, it's use in uh, private capital. Now, I've kind of started to come a little bit more to a conclusion. We need some sort of regulation. We need to start to ask some critical questions. Now, certainly, some are asking critical questions about these various platforms like Facebook and Google. Mm -hmm. The EU is doing a much better job at this than we are uh, when it comes to your right to privacy. We have no explicit right to privacy uh, that's written in the Constitution. We have no explicit law, uh, especially when it comes to digital information. Uh, that's different in different countries. So, for example, Spain, uh, who wrote their constitution in, I think, 1975, um, basically uh, when the dictator there uh, died and they re reorganized their government, does have a right to privacy built into their constitution for electronic records. So that's why you see the case for the right to be forgotten uh, that was uh, came out of the EU. Um, against Google, that actually... You mean to have all of your records expunged? Or? Not expunged, but uh, the index in Google um, to point to those records. Mm. So while the original records can't be expunged, so let's say that there's a record uh, on a case net that I had, uh, you know, 20 traffic tickets and, and did some an embarrassing thing downtown. I don't want every time you search for my name for that be, to be the top result, right? So yeah. it's amount there right to privacy, the way this is interpreted is called the right to be forgotten. Um, that um, while you can't remove the original entry on CaseNet, you could in fact uh, have the, the link, the link uh, in the search engine. Um, and you know, that's one of the interesting things about Google and Facebook and all these other places. They're using 
other data. Google doesn't generate any data, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> so yeah. YouTube doesn't generate any videos, really. They've started to do a few things, but it's really other people's work and the way they index it, repackage it, do predictive models on it. Who actually puts YouTube videos up does, because you have to have a certain, you know, skill set to do that, which is obtained in a not too difficult manner. But then you also have to have that desire to maneuver or to have some type of power of communication. Yeah, I mean, YouTube is an interesting um, platform. Uh, they've come under a lot of criticism because of the fact that, uh, especially uh, this group that Alec Jones uh, is involved in, uh, I'm blanking on the name right now, but very, very right-wing uh, group, and um, has been banned from it. But they've been very good about creating other accounts, getting their accounts uh, set up and uploading that. And unfortunately, Google's algorithm, once again, is driving toward keeping you on the site. And a lot of their suggestions drive you down a path that becomes very radical very fast. Once again, that can be in either direction. That can be right or left. Mm -hmm. But uh, that computer is saying, well, we want Scott. Scott seems to be excited about whatever he's watching here. And uh, so we'll go ahead and... S and how can they measure your level of excitement <clears throat> such that they start maneuvering? Uh, watch time. So uh, they yeah, can determine sure. how long you watched a video where did they drop off I have a little a YouTube channel and I find that I can go look at those statistics and I can look at an individual video and it says okay well most people watched the entire video they watched only the first 10 seconds of it um, you can get all sorts of data like that if you they like it as soon as they saw this yeah they, they like a video they clicked on an ad that was in the video so that's a big thing right because you there's a lot of uh, advertising that goes on on YouTube <clears throat> And that's how you have these um, YouTubers that are uh, making a career out of it and making millions of dollars is because they get millions of dollars from those ads, right? So, so individuals actually go in, create a YouTube or two, and then somehow the get algorithm. funding. Yeah, ads. it's fairly easy uh, to do. You set up an account with uh, Google Ads or what they used to call AdWords, and you basically link that to your YouTube account. And you have to have like a thousand subscribers and a certain number of views, and then they will allow you to monetize that uh, platform. Hmm. So. It's uh, an interesting platform. I think it's becoming a little bit saturated. Um, a lot of students here at MU will, uh, and I'm sure at the other colleges, want to become YouTubers and travel the world and, and uh, uh, do it all on somebody else's. Yeah, no, it's uh, fun. Do you actually teach people how to do that within some of your courses at MU? Or? We look at that at uh, one of my undergraduate courses. We look at social media. We look at uh, how do you um, use these tools. One is because my students are young. So as soon as they go into any job, all us old folks are going to look at them and say, oh my goodness, you can handle our website. <laughs> you can take <laughs> yeah. over our Instagram account. Right, you can right. take over our Facebook yeah. page. And a lot of them are very good consumers of this. Mm -hmm. Or actually, maybe not that good at consumers. They're not sometimes that thoughtful, but um, they uh, don't know how to produce that. So we do look at how do you produce that, uh, and just so that they have a, an idea that it is uh, you know possible to do these things. The children of the digital age, they are they're so comfortable. Older people are using it a lot, and they're... Yeah, they're giving in... their data. And I think sometimes um, folks of our generation, older have a little bit more of a tendency to not be uh, skeptical enough of things they see on the internet. Oh, uh, and so you I'm actually find too. that a lot of people that are, you know, like my age and over are um, often forwarding these fake news pieces, these pieces of news that were made, for example, in the last presidential election, there was a, a bunch of people in different uh, uh, I think Macedonia and other Eastern uh, Bloc countries or former Eastern Bloc countries that were producing these fake websites. You know, it looked like a news and it would say Hillary is a lizard monster and runs a pedophile ring out of a out of a pizza shop. Well, all those were <laughs> getting forwarded and reposted uh, often by people of our age. So it was not um, the young people saw that and said, oh, this is a bunch of whatever. 
ignored it, but uh, a lot of people, yeah. yeah, and so those machine learning algorithms said, oh, Scott forwarded that, he'd like some more, let's give him some more, and yeah. so you start to get to this kind of biased nature of uh, your thinking, and it's very hard, once a human has decided something, uh, it's very hard to convince them that it's not true. So it's called the information bias. And uh, the more information you give somebody that Hillary is not a lizard person, uh, the more they'll dig in to their beliefs. Uh, and that goes true. It's, it's right or left. It's just part of human nature. But oftentimes we're satisfied with just a little bit. And so we remain with even just the words, like we have a precedent that uses certain words to tag people. And they're repeated so, like, crooked Hillary remained. Yeah. And it yep. was hard, even if you're a big fan, it was hard not to... Oh, well, uh, Trump, I would say, is one of the best politicians as far as use of language. Oh. Um, he also did something very early on in the campaign. Uh, he said that Hillary doesn't have the stamina. Okay, And that was an interesting... When he said it, I thought that was an interesting use of words, because he's basically set her up. Okay, so there's you hear that once, and you're like, oh, she doesn't have the stamina. Well, yeah. then she's campaigning for 48 hours, has the flu, and stumbles a little bit, or has a cough on the stand. And, and every politician's going to do that if you're campaigning at this level. Okay, then everybody's like, oh, Trump was right, doesn't have the stamina. So uh, he is very good about setting these things up. As humans, uh, that's kind of the confirmation bias. So we might we could also just talk all about biases as yeah. well, but confirmation bias that confirms uh, that that was true. It ha happens in our own life, right? So when we get lucky, sometimes we think we're brilliant and we're really not brilliant, we're just lucky. Uh, <laughs> some sort of confirmation bias, but um, we also have this ability as humans to abstract, right? So uh, if we, uh, it probably helped us a lot in our early survival. So you see a tiger just ate that thing. Uh, that other thing that looks like a tiger just ate that thing. Okay, I better stay away from tigers. So we have this ability to abstract and put these ideas in our brain. So you hear Cro Crooked Hillary. You haven't read anything about them. Crooked Hillary, Crooked Hillary. Um, and then you start to think, oh, well, she must be crooked. Okay, and you know that can happen for anybody. So if you just use that language against an opponent or against somebody, um, that will form a bias. And then if if there is something that happens, then you'll be like, oh, that's an evidence of that crookedness. That's the confirmation bias. And Scott, can I ask you this? The use of these words that embed our thinking um, does that go? hand in hand with some type of economic flow? Well, I think the business world has been <laughs> captured by this idea since the uh, 1970s when really this kind of neocons kind of took over our economic system. We were obviously in a, a, a bind that we hadn't seen before with stagflation, and they came in with this idea that if you cut taxes, it'll lead to more growth, right? So this idea, it sounds kind of intuitively right, okay? So uh, this guy Laffler has uh, Laffler has uh, promoted this. He was recently given a uh, one of the highest civilian awards by the President of the United States for his uh, um, ideas, but he's been proven wrong and wrong again. Okay, so you see what happened with Kansas. They cut taxes. Well, you don't have money for roads. You don't have money for uh, schools. You see what's going on. It seems on. like the same thing is happening here in Missouri. Well, there's been a big push for that, and that <laughs> yeah. it just doesn't uh, play out. It sounds like a good idea, but it doesn't play out. And this also this idea that if you uh, give tax cuts, people are going to hire more, businesses will hire more people. We heard that in the recessions when uh, uh, George W. Bush was president. But the data shows that what those businesses did was they invested in machines. Manufacturing has actually been going up in the U.S. for 20 years. There's this idea that manufacturing is on a decline. No, manufacturing is up. It is the fact that the jobs in manufacturing have been on a steady decline because we've been able to automate and refine these processes better and better. Sure, and we, the public, we, the workers, help them along. Right. Uh, instead of lining up in the grocery stores and keeping that person who is checking us out, right. we go into the automatic and we do the work ourselves. <laughs> it's clever, isn't it? And there's a there's a cleverness behind all uh, helping the unsuspecting customers 
Yeah, it's a shift from we have to maximize shareholder value as being the dominant strategy for uh, businesses. And really, this was not uh, as emphasized, like I said, uh, until the 1970s, okay, that uh, corporations and businesses are, were around for other reasons, social good, um, uh, employing people, that that was seen as part of your um, responsibility as a business. Now that's all been replaced by value for shareholders. Now I ran my own business for 18 years and uh, I can say that um, I think there's a lot more things to business than uh, just uh, maximizing your profits, right? Um, mm -hmm. There's a lot of other value that can be uh, derived. But uh, getting back to AI, you know, one of the big things that uh, is a concern about AI is job loss. So you start to look at the jobs that are being done by accountants, being done by, um, you know, educated people. These may be replaced soon by some AI that is able to optimize, take all the tax code, take all your records and optimize for lowest tax. You know, you could yeah. have a, a, an algorithm do that. And um, so probably what we're going to end up with is more people at the very high end employed, so very high level intellectual strategy work. Who and make the decisions. They make the yeah. decisions and plan out the strategy and the lower level workers who flip burgers. Because yes, you could make a machine that flipped a burger, but frankly, it's so darn cheap to get a person for, what is it, 10, 12 bucks an hour here in Missouri now to flip the burgers, uh, that's easier than having a machine do it. So um, there's going to be this kind of bifurcation of the of the workforce into these two categories is what some people are worried about. I obviously I don't have a crystal ball on this. Mm -hmm. But how will AI affect uh, our uh, jobs? Are we going to be replaced by it? We'll be we're working side by side. Um, well, it looks like that's already happening in a certain sense because, you know, you, what you're talking about between the, the upper layer of the CEOs, etc., and the, the people who are flipping burgers, you've got the middle class. So you're eliminating the middle class. And aren't we seeing sort of the, some of the middle class kind of fall through the cracks right yeah, now? Yeah, you've seen a lot of people that are really uh, under, underemployed, we call it. So uh, you have people that are... Um, I'm sure here in Columbia that are working jobs well below their education or what they were trained for. Uh, and so that's going to become a, a big problem. Now, uh, it's interesting that you see even people like Jeff Bezos, the richest man in the world who gets by without paying any tax, but that's a whole uh, different uh, issue. Um, uh, he's come forth with this idea of a universal basic income, and several other people have as well. And I, as some people say, well, um, that's, I, I think there's, there's separate issues as to look into there, but the fact that the richest man in the world may be saying this might be that uh, he, you know, wants to not be the first one targeted in the revolt of the workers or something like that. <laughs> there's a reasoning in his madness. Right, uh, something right. We have to let our listening audience know that we're speaking with Professor Scott Christensen. He's with the School of Business at the University of Missouri. He's an assistant professor there, and he's um, talking to us about artificial intelligence. Most of us are, oh, well, I'm not sure. I'll speak for myself. I am an uninformed user of technology. I think there's some skepticism for going on Facebook, not only now, but even before. Is that because I'm of the older generation, or is it because well, of skepticism? There are generational differences, and actually it's kind of interesting, because I would say the generation I'm teaching right now in college, uh, which is, I guess, what, Generation Z or something like that, um, they... Um, are actually much more skeptical, much more thoughtful about what information they do post or release. Um, they tend to like to use things like Snapchat, where things go away, uh, instead of Facebook. Um, I actually was on Facebook for many years, and uh, then finally this January, I quit using Facebook. I deleted my account, uh, just because they're just such a horrible company. I mean, they have violated, you know, FTC uh, consent decrees. They uh, continue to, uh, I think the last straw was when they had uh, bypassed these mechanisms so that uh, under 13 year olds could buy things on Facebook because it generated sales. Yeah, um, what was it? Last week, the FTC uh, uh, gave them a $5 billion fine. And what happened? Facebook stock went up next morning because it was such a small amount to basically not only 
deal with the Cambridge Analytica, but they basically indemnified them for anything that had happened. So if it turns out that there's something far worse that happened in the past, they can't be prosecuted at, at least at the federal level or fined uh, at the federal level. And uh, so I think their stock is up by $8 billion um, since that $5 billion fine. So it's just a drop in the bucket for this uh, company. Do you, within your character as a professor at the university, do you scan the businesses that are on the rise and look at their technology? Um, yeah, I guess so. Uh, we do a lot with uh, entrepreneurship. I mean, it's sort of a research project for yourself and students. Well, we try. I try to keep up with what's going on. Um, it's interesting when you start to talk about things like social networks and search. There's these uh, companies that are basically monopolies, right? So um, if you and I created a better search engine than Google. We're not going to get any funding for it, right? So uh, what's interesting uh, is that these kind of big, big companies kind of block innovation in some ways. Uh, they don't compete with each other, or sometimes they kind of compete with each other, um, but not really. And please know we're speaking with Professor Scott Christensen from the University of Missouri, the School of Business. We're talking about Artificial Intelligence, AI 101. And Scott, we're talking about Google now and the huge impact that it there's, it's, a, it's a monopoly in, in this area of search and in advertising. And well, what makes it a monopoly is not only its search engine, but the huge amount of data is collected about us. So, for example, a lot of your listeners probably, probably use Gmail. Well, Gmail is a nice free email, but, of course, Google scans all your emails for keywords, and they can use that then for uh, targeted advertising. So it is kind of co hop co-opted our, some people call it digital exhaust, but the stuff that's left over from our transactions uh, to be able to make predictive models. So um, it, let's say that uh, tomorrow we all decided to start, start using some other search engine or to stop using Google. Well, it would take many, many years for that same sort of data set to be uh, built up by another company. So there's this what we call mo a moat. So sometimes we call it a, a, a moat in business to um, keep competitors out or to keep our users locked in. Okay, so, right. So this uh, protective layer uh, it prevents users from switching. So that's one of the things when we look at as far as competitive forces is how easy is it to switch to a. a, a uh, an alternative, and also uh, what are the threats of new entrants, okay? So that's, for example, why restaurants are kind of a bad business to be in. I don't want to disparage any restaurants, but um, it's difficult, very difficult, because there's a huge chance you're going to have new entrants, right? So if we um, come up with a uh, great new cuisine here uh, in Colombia and we're flocked every uh, night by uh, customers, um, probably another business is going to open up with that. There's no moats around that, okay? You can't say that Scott has official license for uh, serving haggis in, uh, in uh, downtown uh, Missouri or something like that. So, uh, but these other places have built up these moats that are uh, fairly substantial. And um, there's a lot of reasons why they become more and more valuable the more you use it and the more uh, people are on it. It's supposed to be valuable, the data of, of each individual. How are they going to use that to make money other than what we, the public, understands is driving them to buy a Ford rather than a, than a Saab? Well, uh, let's say that you could use um, data from these different sources to determine uh, or to give a machine learning algorithm um, the data in order that they would predict whether you were a good risk for a loan. So uh, there are some applications that are often being used in Africa where you can, uh, I think this was where it's been pioneered, where basically you download this loan application. It then logs into your Facebook and everything else. It, it looks at where you've been, at what time of day, all that kind of stuff, where you live. Okay, And then, then it says, okay, well, um, Scott is kind of a so-so um, risk here, so uh, we'll give him a loan, but it'll be a 10%. 
Okay. Now, Daria is a model citizen, uh, has been all her life, and uh, we're going to give her a loan at 2% because we think there's less risk there. So can you dynamically change insurance rates based on your driving? Can you dynamically change uh, loan rates based on your behavior? I Now we talk about morality, is that good or bad? Well, I don't know. I think uh, what the, the thing that disturbs me is we don't know what those inputs are. Okay, we don't know why we got a high percentage. So some people have called for kind of an FDA for artificial intelligence or for these algorithms. That some basic, type of transparency. Yeah, we should know what's in it, right? Yeah. So you look at your drugs or you look at your... Um, uh, food that you buy, and it has a list of ingredients, right? Because it's mandated that you tell what those ingredients are. So if I go to get a loan and I get denied, it could say, well, here were the ingredients that were used to pick uh, your loan rate or your loan. Um, so I think uh, that's one of the disturbing things is the lack of transparency in many of these algorithms that are setting forth uh, different assumptions. They may work for groups of individuals, but not for every individual. Just because you're poor and you live in a poor area of town, does that really mean that individual is a bad loan risk? Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. um, well. But there's just a general assumption. A generalization, that going to be. Uh, and uh, because of those locations. So there's actually uh, banks have gotten into trouble with this before because they will outsource to a third party the determination on a loan. Well, that third party isn't restricted. And so that third party, uh, the way a bank would be in making those determinations. So um, that third party may use, uh, for example, um, zip code as one of their input criteria. Well, zip code is tied to race. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I, I can I can know if you're in a particular zip code or sub code uh, with a high probability what your race would be. It's not you know 100% mm -hmm. accurate, but we can get probabilities from that. Yeah. Well, and then we get into that larger area. But one thing, uh, just a economic question or a banking question, does a person know if their loan is being outsourced to another group? I'm not sure that they do. I, I would, I'm not really clear on that. I would have to ask some of my banker friends. Yeah, yeah. That would make a difference also. That's part of transparency, is it right. not? When you, when you ask for Loaning, but they always think that the transparency has to come on the other side, right. perhaps. Right. So a protection for the banks rather than protection for those who are seeking a loan. Right. So having uh, uh, transparency in uh, these algorithms, how they're being calculated, how they're being used, and also transparency in how our data is being used. And so uh, when you go on Facebook and and your uh, news feed is there, and uh, if it told you that well this news feed is optimized to get you to click on ads or get optimized for your um, uh, ability to stay engaged or something like that, um, that would be a little bit different. So I think what we really need to look is not at individual platforms like Facebook, but uh, so much as how do we look at asking critical questions about privacy, our right to privacy, our right to restrict the collection of our data in the first place, not just the right to control how they use it, but the right to even restrict our, our data. And then the right to, so for example, maybe I don't want uh, my face being recognized as I walk down the street. Okay, or as you slide through the, at the airport. Right, mm -hmm. right. Um, I would say the airport is a little bit different because not everybody has to fly, mm -hmm. but um, I, generally everybody walks down the street if they can. Sure. And um, I think, uh, you know, these public spaces, uh, private companies co-opting the data from those public spaces seems uh, like a question we don't even ask ourselves. We, we just take it as an assumption that we give up the, that data. Well, why do we give it up? Who decides who decides, um, you know, what happens with that data? These are really large questions. We have to f figure out where we are in this, where we are concerned. And I certainly think politically, if you have a certain mindset in the political ring, you're going to be put into different categories. Are you not? Uh, you mean as far as uh, what messages you'll be delivered? or? Well, not obviously what messages you'll be delivered, but also will governments categorize you as being right-wing, left-wing, right. moderate, wealthy, moderate, or right. whatever. You're going to be falling into these larger categories. 
I would have to think about that a little bit uh, for examples here in the U.S. Certainly, um, there's all sorts of ways that different data is aggregated to determine political leaning by political parties here. But you start to look, you were mentioning China and the idea of facial recognition technology. Well, in some uh, cities, they're using this to develop basically a trust score. So, oh, Scott's jaywalking again, so his trust score goes down. Um, so, and, it's real big brother watching you, Right, and so yeah. some of the China, the culture there is much different. So, some people that have been interviewed in these cities think it's a good thing because they're like, I always stop at the stoplight, and darn it, if Scott isn't always jaywalking, it's about time he you know, got dinged for that. Uh, but we start to see what's going on in uh, Western China with uh, these Muslim minorities and basically using that same technology to uh, target and identify uh, people that are a part of this minority group. Uh, and that's uh, fairly disturbing. Very disturbing. So we see that artificial intelligence has basically innovative and perhaps even positive. Oh, there's uh, a, yeah, there's many aspects that are mm -hmm. very positive. And I would say um, a good example, this is in radiology. So radiology is something that uh, takes many years to learn how to read a radiograph and identify, okay, uh, it looks like Scott has, you know, a little uh, lesion on his lung. He's maybe got lung cancer or something like that at the beginning of that. It's very difficult to diagnose, right? Right? Mm -hmm. or even using uh, x-rays for pneumonia. Uh, they've actually, um, that's a very interesting area because you can take an x-ray and if the doctor says he doesn't have pneumonia, but then two days later he has pneumonia because you've done a culture and find out that it actually is pneumonia, then you can know that that was a misdiagnosis. Also, you can know false positives. So I say, oh yes, Scott had has m a pneumonia. Two days later, you get the culture back. Oh, he doesn't have pneumonia. That was a false positive. Right. So there's huge data sets there on real people, and that's been fed into these machine learning algorithms, and they are actually better than a radiologist at predicting pneumonia, and it's starting to become better at certain types of um, other diseases. Mm -hmm. And so in that case, we'll probably see a doctor working alongside um, a uh, uh, an AI or a computer because my doctor knows my history, uh, knows, you know, my risk behaviors. And if they say, well, Scott was a, a, a smoker for years, so uh, I'm going to be really, I'm going to trust this AI more than I might otherwise because of that behavior that I know is predictive of lung cancer. Mm -hmm. um, so there's some really fantastic things that are coming out of AI. Um, so I don't want to say that it's all negative, but I do think that when we look at this, um, there's some uh, questions we have to really think about uh, when we especially turn it loose uh, via these private companies uh, on things like our children. Yeah, I imagine in the educational sector it's used and will be used a lot. Yeah, and there's a, a kind of a revolt that ha happened in Kansas. There was a platform that was uh, supposedly uh, all AI-based, and it would help the student have individual learning. Well, they basically would bring the students in the morning, sit them in front of their Chromebooks, and they would supposedly sit there and learn from the computer all day. Well, you and I know that learning is not about just facts. It's a social engagement. Okay, That's why we meet face to face. Uh, and in fact, one of the main predictors of uh, my students' uh, success is how well they connect with their teachers. Okay, Because when you connect with somebody, you have an interest in why they're interested in that subject. You can uh, relate to the subject. You can understand each other better. So I would say that learning is, in fact, uh, not easily digitized, but is a very social process. Well, we've been talking with Scott Christensen, Professor Scott Christensen, who has um, been giving us a lot of information about artificial intelligence. And uh, Scott, I hope you'll return. Oh, I'd love to. Lead us forward in this uh, we'll quest do, we'll for information. Do, we'll do AI 102. <laughs> that would be fantastic. <laughs> I really appreciate that. Um, thank you so much for coming to KOPN and uh, giving us artificial intelligence uh, info. Okay, thank you very much. Right. Okay, great.